Hi class, this is your Professor Joseph. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to discuss Chapter 20 today, uh, Manual Kant. Rehabilitating Reason Without Strict Limits. So um, today, um, two parts on this little mini lecture. I'll discuss briefly Kant's metaphysics slash epistemology, basically his contributions to those. And then what is really well known for as well as his ethical contribution so how he grounds morality of an action so um, to get started once again i've already have expected you've done your reading um, and just to let you know kant is one of the hardest philosophers to read period he is very detailed um he thought a lot about what he was going to say in response to hume for years uh, what was his first pub published article? It was when he was 50-something. Yeah. Um, but it's mind-boggling to read him. So unless, unless you read Kant a lot and repeatedly, you can get some of the basics of what he's doing. But to get into the weeds of how he argues what he's doing, there's even debates on how to interpret some of his metaphysics and epistemology. But we won't go into that. Keep it real simple. Um, but to start... Um, let's go to this. Let's go to this little PowerPoint. Um, okay, so Kant says, so he's basically responding to Hume. Remember how Hume was, um, his epistemology, how he could know things, in other words, um, were limited to the inductive reasoning he used, and they were based upon experience. And that's pretty much where he left us. And Kant says, eh, even though our knowledge begins with experience, um, we're going to go you know, deeper than that. He's going to give you certain knowledge based upon a priori reasoning, and those are based upon categories of reality. I'll get into that in a second. Um, but he says, but there is something determinate in the mind that causes us to know what we know. So you might say instead of looking at the world in and of itself, like if I were to look at a, an apple across from me or a chair instead of analyzing it like what are the properties inside the apple or inside the chair Kant's going to be like what are the properties inside your mind looking at the chair or what categories of reality does your mind map on to that thing chair or you know when you think of chairness what's happening in your mind so <laughs> you might say in order for Kant to know about reality He's first going to start with his epistemology, and that's first going to start with categories in your mind. So it gets really complicated really fast, but here we go. And that's the distinction between the nominal and the phenomenal, um, and you can look at that in your chapters. But he says, the mind is so structured that it imposes interpretive categories on our experience. So that's what I mean by categories of reality. We'll impose those onto, let's say we're looking at something in reality, like a chair or an apple. It could be anything. Um, and we won't be able to make sense of what we see in reality or what we experience unless we first have those categories of reality that we map onto what we're looking at or experiencing. And Kant will call this the Copernican Revolution. And I'll read this. Until now, we have assumed that all of our knowledge must conform to objects. We must see uh, whether we may have better uh, success if we begin with our assumption that objects must conform to our knowledge. In this way, we would have knowledge of objects a priori. A priori means necessarily. Um, just upon reason alone, we can know that certain things exist. Um, but it conforms to our knowledge, meaning it conforms to how we map on these concepts to what we're um, experiencing in reality. So we'll get into this a little bit. Our, the understanding does not derive its laws a priori from, it prescribes them to nature. Um, so, again, and well, I'll show you this. It'll make a little bit more sense um, in a second here. We have, therefore, some at least uncontested synthetical knowledge a priori and need not ask whether it's possible for it is actual. So, in a nutshell, he's saying, hey, Hume, nice try, but you're not going to get us knowledge the way we want it because of your own problems with experience and using inductive reasoning. Um, so at best you're going to, you're going to remain a little skeptical. And remember that's what Hume left us with mitigated skepticism. 
Kant's going to say, that's because your metaphysics and epistemology are a little different from mine. I'm going to give us, I'm going to get us certain knowledge and it's going to have to do with categories of reality inside of our mind that we impose on things we look at um, out there. And this is what's going to be called synthetical knowledge or a priori, but um, oh yeah. So, and then last but not least, the second thing that I'm going to be moving into is Kant's ethics. And this is a lot easier to understand than his metaphysics epistemology. So you could like pump the brakes on what we just discussed a little bit and say, oh, ethics, way easier. And I'm going to show you a little document that I'll make right in front of you. So later on in this book, you'll learn about utilitarianism for Mill and other contributors, um, but he's the main one. Um, but it's basically... How do you ground morality, a wrongness or rightness of an action or goodness or badness of people and character? Like, how, how do we know things are good and bad? And I'll show you this. Well, Kant, um, he's going to reject Mill's utilitarianism that you'll see later on. And he's going to say that we legislate our own morality based upon pure reasoning. And you might think, you know, um, we're using reasoning already. If, if you've done the reading, by the way, don't feel alone if you say to yourself, I don't even understand what's going on. A lot of people don't reading Kant for the first time. But this class is an introductory class to the you know history of philosophy. And the reason I like this book is I'm exposing you to a few things that Kant has done, not just one, not just ethics, not just metaphysics, not just epistemology, but how about all of them, just a little at a time. But you might say all of them a little at a time for Kant is like getting hit with a grenade in the face. Like it's so detailed. It's so don't feel alone. Like I said, but um, again, I'll try to make it more simple for you. Um, I just want you to be exposed. Just seeing what Kant has contributed to the great conversation of philosophy. Like, you know, what, what's he done? Well, he's contributed in very detailed format to a few areas. So here's, here's a very important point. Remember how Hume said that uh, passions are a slave, no, sorry, a reason is a slave to the passions. Kant's gonna reverse that and say, no, not quite. Um, ethics is based not on feeling, but on reason, pure reason. So you might say, he slaps Hume right across the face and says, no, not even close. So Kant is gonna say by pure reason and pure reason alone, we can get how to ground morality and the goodness and badness of our rightness and wrongness of actions. And it's not on feelings. In fact, it has nothing to do with feelings at all. So you're going to get a complete 180 here. Um, and yeah, here's a famous quote is, it is impossible to conceive anything at all in a world or even out of it, which can be taken as good without qualification, except for a good will. And that's going to have everything to do with us as human persons. We have good wills. And if we're having a good will, it's because we're, we're using pure reason to establish that. Um, beauty is the necessity to act out of reverence for the moral law. So the way Kant does his ethics is this, not just what I think is wrong or right, but in this situation, what anybody in this situation would think is wrong or right. And therefore, not just me, but anyone in this situation should act or forced to act a certain way out of pure reason. And that's the magic Kant will offer with his ethics is not just some subjective, what do I think is good, bad, or right and wrong, because we could disagree all day long. But what does pure rationality legislate? And what that does is it casts a more objective feature of morality. In other words, not just what I think, but what everyone should do in this situation regardless if it's me if it's you or me or my mom or my uncle or a cousin or whoever it is or some person working at walmart all of us in this situation should act this certain way so it's pretty powerful reasoning going on to to get us what we ought to do um so he gives us two uh, ca uh imperatives and you'll notice in your reading, you're going to have hypothetical versus categorical. And um, I'll read it to you. Kant's first formulation of the categorical imperative. Act only on that maxim whereby you can at the same time will 
that it would become a universal law. Um, I'll go over that in a minute. And the second formulation of the categorical imperative. And I really like this about Kant's um, reasoning here in ethics. So act as to treat humanity, whether in your own person or that in it, in, oh, sorry, that of any other, in every case as an end and never merely as a means only. And what he's going after here is this. Don't use somebody as a means to an end to get what you want. For example, let's say you're in a relationship. You don't really care about the other person. You just want what you want. You just want pleasure so that you can feel satisfied. And you don't really care because you'll drop the other person at the drop of a dime. They mean nothing to you. You're just using them. Kant's formulation here would say that you actually can't do that. And the second that you do do that, you're being irrational and you're not having a good will and you're using the other person and you should never do that. You should value them inherently in and of themselves. They are valuable. You should never use somebody. So, um, yeah, and you can extend this in a multitude of ways. Um, but nobody should ever die so that you can live. Nobody, you shouldn't, you should never use sex, um, um, to fulfill your own desires at the sake of, or uh, at forsaking somebody else. Because when you do these type of actions and there's thousands of others we could think about, um, because you're using somebody else as a means to an end and Kant would say, no, you have to value everybody in the sense that they have inherent worth, including yourself. And this is beautiful because you, at that very point, you're thinking rationally, you have a good will towards others and you're not using other people. Very fascinating. So that's how he grounds the morality. And I'll get into that a little bit more. So that's just a brief on a little PowerPoint of things that I'll go over. But of course, here's your, um, um, your modules in your canvas. And, you know, I got a picture of Kant. That's what, you know, that's when he was young. Um, you know, and, and Kant is Prussian and Prussia was like a German empire before Germany and Poland existed as unified or sorry, as separate, uh, countries. There was Prussia. It's kind of funny. I'm Prussian. Like Komorowski is really Komorowski. So I go back um, in history, my name goes back to where Kant goes. Pretty funny, even though we didn't know Kant, of course, you know what I'm just saying. But we go back to the same part of history together um, as the Komorovskis were Prussian farmers way, you know, in the 1700s. Um, so basically, that leaves us, you know, in our reading, like what's a date or a timestamp, 1724 to 1804. So the Komorovskis migrated from um, Prussia, um, in the late 1800s. So anyways, we go back to this time period. Well, let me bring you back to canvas one second. So again, I give you videos. Kant and his life works pretty funny. They don't go real detail oriented in this video does not go into his metaphysics epistemology that I'm going to do in a second here. And if you want detail though, about phenomena and noumena and the self and exactly how he, um, his epistemology works and his metaphysics, you can look at these two videos. And of course, if you want to use his ethics, you can go to this video. And this guy right here, he's amazing. Um, his crash course videos, I love him. Um, I'll touch on his ethics and a little bit of these. But if you want real super detail, of course, your book has it right in front of you. But if you can't understand that just by reading, um, I always love videos. And I do this because some of you love reading and that's it. You're very detail oriented. You read it. You're like, I got it. Done. Quiz. Done. Moving on. Some of you, though, you look at um, detail-oriented reading and you're thinking, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't get what's going on. The reason I like videos is there's a lot of pictures. And with pictures, one picture can form a th or can you know, act as a thousand words. It can, it can formulate difficult concepts better. So I have these videos so that I have a variety of learning modes or modes of learning so that some of you can learn through these videos as well. So again, if you don't understand the reading, just do a light reading once, come to the videos, listen to my video, should be done. And to alleviate some of you that are stressing, you don't have to understand everything about Kant. He's one of the most difficult philosophers that ever existed on the planet ever. <laughs> so you're in good company. Um, but yeah, pondering Kant's epistemology is like, 
you got to be kidding me. That's how crazy sophisticated it was. But it's different from Hume. So in, in one sense, Kant is an empiricist, just like Locke, just like Hume, but he, and just like Barclay, but his form's way different. Yeah, you can only know things from experience and by experience, by experience in the world. But here's the deal. You're not just experiencing the chair or the apple or something in front of you. In and of itself, you are bound by the concepts that your mind has mapping on to the apple and the chair. And these are categories of reality that are inherent in your mind. Kant, Kant doesn't really do it in this chapter. You, you might even say they're inherently given to you by God. Kant was a believer, by the way, um, in God, just like Descartes, um, unlike Hume. Uh, but you might say he did not believe that arguments for the existence of God, and I won't really go into that today. He didn't really believe that you could use those to prove the existence of God because he said, look, the only way you can prove the existence of God is by your own experience. And you might say you can experience God, but you have no idea how to put that on paper in an argument form, you know, my experience of God is like this. It's, it's just too, it's beyond um, comprehension. So he didn't waste his time with arguments for the existence of God, even though he believed in God. And that brings me to one distinction that I want you to know. It's called the no slash show distinction. You may think you know something about ethics or God or morality, or I already said that that's under ethics or politics or, um, you know, whatever it is. And you may know this, but showing it to somebody else, arguing or trying to prove it, maybe a whole different ballpark. Some of you think that um, if you believe something and somebody else has a belief contrary to yours, you might say, well, show me or prove it to me. But they might not have to do any of that. It might be that they can't do that. So Kant might say something like, I can't prove that God exists to you. Um, you have to experience God on your own. Um, whereas Descartes might say, no, we can certainly show you God exists. Here's an argument. So yeah, we're going to have disagreements with people that, um, do believe in God. So, um, that's, that's something just interesting to note, even though I'm not going to go into arguments for the existence of God and how Kant looked at those any more than that. Um, but yeah, no versus show. Some of us like showing people things because we want to persuade them and argue for our points. And Kant would just say simply, you are wasting your time when it comes to arguments for the existence of God. You can read about him more later on, on that area if you want. But this is just me giving you um, my take on doing research of, uh, with Kant in the past. Um, okay, so let's go into your reading. Um, so I love this quote that um, Kant gives us from Hume. Because um, Kant actually respects Hume, even though he disagrees with his metaphysics and epistemology. He definitely says, yeah, Hume, you're on the right path with experiencing things in reality and how we get knowledge. I'm just going to show you how you know you might be wrong and how I can prove this to you. But he definitely, he piggybacks off of Hume and he responds to him. But what he does in the beginning here, he compliments Hume. He says, I freely admit it was David Hume's remark that first many years ago interrupted my dogmatic slumber and gave a completely different direction to my inquiries. Dogmatic slumber just means I was fixed in the way I thought. Like I thought only one way. But Hume comes along and says, hey, you're being dogmatic. You're so fixed. You, you have to be able to think in a different way. And Kant says, I did after I, uh, you know, thought about what you said, Hume, but the way I thought is different from yours, but you might say, um, yeah. So again, Kant piggybacks off of Hume, but he tips his hat off to him and he says, Hey man, thank you so much for waking me up. Now I'm going to begin a philosophical quest. that's going to last for years and I'm finally going to respond to you. <laughs> um, but here's what I want to do. The reading is very intense, but I want to show you. You can watch the videos for the a priori, a posteriori. Um, I've went over that in a previous video. 
a priori reasoning is necessary reasoning that you get. Um, we obtain our knowledge and it's never on a degree of right or wrong or um, um, true or false. It is literally 100% true or 100% false. That's what a priori is. And it's, um, it's reasoning alone. You don't have to go out and experience things in reality like a scientist would by like measuring, um, you know, things in a laboratory or subjecting them to cold or heat or electrical shock or things like that. That's a posteriori reasoning. But oddly enough, um, Kant's going to say, I'm going to give you those types of reasoning, but then I'm going to give you another distinction, analytic and sy synthetic. And then I'm going to show you how um, people previous to, to me were wrong. And this is where we get his synthetic truths. But anyways, um, do a brief reading here and look at the video. And I think you'll get a much better picture. And it's specifically this one, metaphysics of knowledge, very detailed. Um, but, I, but I think this, this guy does a really good job. And the reason I won't focus a lot of time on this is I'm going to spend a little bit more time on ethics with Hume. Oh, uh, sorry, with Kant. Um, and his categories of reality. So, yeah, so you'll see his synthetic a posteriori um, and analytic a priori. But I want to show you something else that I find is mind blowing. This is just, um, this deals with categories of reality now. And I'm going to piggyback it off of Aristotle. So let me scroll. Oh, yeah. Whew. Capacities of the rational mind. I mean, uh, when you sit back and you start meditating on reality and, and philosophically, you, you want to think deeper about reality. Do you do you come up with something like this? <laughs> I don't either. I mean, this is this is awesome. This would take you a couple hours just looking at it to figure out, like, what is going on here? But let me get to the... Um, let me take categories. Yeah, you know what? I'll fact I'll do it better. This is a website that I really love. It's um, and it's in my first video. Stanford Encyclopedia, awesome, up to date. It's the most scholarly, philosophical um, online encyclopedia of philosophy you're ever going to come across. But what I want to show you is um, Aristotle. So let me first. Let me hide this guy. So let me give you Aristotle's metaphysics, and then let me tell you how Kant contributed to that, which I think is really awesome. So Aristotle would say, hey, if we want to know about what is something, what is reality, like what's out there, how do we even go about doing it? Aristotle would say, well, he's going to say, we have to start with categories of reality. If I could dice up reality into different categories, here's um, 10 different categories that things are going to fit into. So basically what Aristotle is going to do is say that everything that you experience in reality, every single thing can be put into these 10 categories. One of these categories will fit the thing you're experiencing into it. One is substance, man, horse, chair, apple, you know, on and on and on, universe, atom. You can think of all kinds of substances, right? What does it take to ha uh, to be a substance? You have to have at least one property. So quantity, you know, things that are quantifiable, um, quality, quality, whiteness, redness, greenness, these are qualities, taste, grammatical, uh, relation, something stands in relationship to something else. When you have uh, two or more things, um, place, where is something in reality, date, yesterday, last year, today, posture, is it lying, is it sitting, like what's it doing, state, has on, has armor on, uh, and by the way, these are just real brief examples, you can go uh, more into Aristotle's metaphysics and find a lot more examples, these are just basic categories of reality, 10 of them, and it'll say everything can fit into one of these 10, action, what are you doing, or what's this thing doing, cutting, burning, passion, um, being cut, being burned. And you might say some of these don't even make sense with our modern vernacular. We're looking back in time into Greek metaphysics and we're like, what, what do you mean by passion? Like I think of like emotional states or feelings, right? And you're saying being cut, being burned, what? You might say, what's something doing? <clears throat> so anyways, 
These are categories that are out there in reality that Aristotle's giving us. They're out there. Kant will come along and say, and this is his huge contribution that I like, he'll give us 12 pure concepts, but they're not out there. They're in here, they're in your mind, and these are what we map on to what we're experiencing in reality. So he's gonna have a metaphysics and he's gonna have categories of reality, but Kant's gonna say, I'm gonna add two more, and everything that can be experienced will be um, inside these categories of reality that are in, turn, they're in your mind that you will map on to metaphysics so here's here's kind of a what's happening here instead of something being out there Kant's gonna say that's how Aristotle does his me uh, metaphysics how I do mine is first by starting with my epistemology how can I know something ah when I look at something out there it turns out I'm mapping on what's in here to out there well what's in here what's in my mind right I'm not doing double talk here What's in my mind is these, these 12 categories of reality, they're coming from me that I'm mapping onto the experience. So you might stay, you might say, instead of us starting with Aristotelian metaphysics, looking at what's out there, we have to first start with what's in here and we have to start with our knowledge claim first. And I know some of that is very confusing. Just know this, Khan has more category, categories of reality than Aristotle does that make a little bit more sense. He piggybacks off Aristotle, but then he says, instead of looking out there, we have to look in here first. And to make sense of what we experience out there in this massive world of experience, we have to start here. So I will map on quantifiable things such as unity, plurality, totality, unity, things are as one, plurality, things like all these many things, totality, a completeness, of things that I experience quality and you're going to get reality negation limitation and again these are these are we're not going into depth here you can read Kant more at what he means by all these relation notice how notice how there Aristotle had one category and it was called uh, relation um, Kant has that category but he goes farther into depth inherence and subsistence causality and dependence community whew, modality and this deals with possibility, like what's possible, what's not possible, existence, what does it mean to exist and versus not exist, and then necessity. So anyways, these are categories of reality, different from Aristotle, some are the same, some are different. And this is what we map on to the objects that we perceive, like apples and chairs, and you know, you know, um, human beings and trees and plants and birds or whatever we experience in reality. So in that sense, um, that's how Kant does his metaphysics by investigating what's out there. But he says in order to do metaphysics, epistemology is completely intertwined with it. You can't separate the two. So when Kant does his metaphysical analysis, he starts inward first and says that first thing that's happening when we look out there is we're stuck mapping on our own categories of reality. And we don't make these up, by the way. Um, these are just inherent in us. Um, but uh, yeah, anyways, that's a lot to, to take in. But what I'll do now is I'll go to Immanuel Kant's um, ethics and just as a brief review, I'll show you something. Um, this guy right here, Kant's first formulation of the categorical imperative, and this is where I think it'll be easier. Act only on that maxim where, whereby you can act at the same time. Uh, will that it would become a universal law? Okay, so now we're gonna come out of the PowerPoint and I'm going to try to simplify this for you. The reason I go this route is me personally, I'm writing my dissertation in ethics, literally right now in philosophy at Claremont Graduate University. And I am an, um, I am a virtue ethicist. So I might disagree a little bit with Kant here, even though I think he's doing something very powerful. And here's, I'm going to show you just 
kind of a three huge views in ethics that you'll come across. Um, but let me, let me, um, let me flip my laptop open. Bear with me for a second here. Okay. Okay. For some reason. I am stuck here. I'll get this open in a second. Okay. You know what? I dropped my pen earlier on the floor. It makes me wonder if my pen does not work anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, just bear with me. Before I started this lecture, I actually dropped it and landed right on the um, tip. So it could be that I cannot use this pen and I must get it fixed now. Yes, I think I've uh, broke my pen. Okay, so no problem. So we're going to have to do um, – we are going to have to use our minds and just imagine what I'm trying to tell you now. All right, so I'm a diehard. Like I, like I want to just try one more time. Hmm. Yeah, it won't work. Okay. So think about it this way. In ethics, when you think about a wrong or right action, how do you know? Well, there's three ways, there's three huge camps in ethics that try to ground morality, the wrongness or rightness of an action. And here's how to think about these three camps. Think about the person doing a certain action, and then you have a consequence. So you have three things, person, action, and then consequence. Now in your mind, think these three, is three, th these three things are separate, right? You have the person doing the action, then you have the action, and then you have the consequence of the action from the person, right? Now say that in these three separate things, we can attach famous figures to arguing which one of these is the most that you should be focusing on and how to ground something. So for example, if we focus on the person, we could start thinking about things uh, you know, if we focus on the person doing the action, we could start thinking about well, what's the person's character like? Are they good or are they bad? And anything that results from bad character is probably a bad action, right? Or what are their intentions? What are their motives? When you start going down that route, you're into virtue ethics territory. You think that grounding morality, you should, we should be looking at the character of the person or the motives or the intentions. That's where we should be focusing, right? In order to figure out whether an action is wrong or right. For Kant, oh, sorry, let me give you the other one. The consequence is when an action has already taken place, then you look at the consequences of that action, right? If the consequences of that action maximize pleasure and reduce pain so that the total consequences of the action are good, then you're in a camp called utilitarianism by a guy named Mill and Bentham. And we'll see those later on in this um, book. We'll see, we'll see those two figures and we'll see the chapter. Um, so they ground morality, not on the intentions or the character of the person, not even on the actual action committed. They want to know whatever action it was, did you get more pleasure out of it and more pain for the most amount of people overall? If so, that's how you should ground morality by looking at the consequences alone. Um, and let me give you an example of how it might work. So let's say like scientifically, let's say you want to test a drug and a few animals have to die and we want to test mascara. You know, let's say you're using makeup or sunscreen or anything like that, that we put on our bodies, male, female, or whoever you are, whatever you are, we're going to want to put a certain chemical on our body. Like I said, let's just say sunscreen, right? Anybody can use that. 
And you might say in order to get that, we have to test how sunscreen works on, on animals first. And you might say, well, that sucks because certain animals have to die in these sorts of testing. A utilitarianist will look at not the actual action of testing animals. They'll say, in the long run, when millions of us are wearing sunscreen on a very hot day out there, and we're more pleasurable because we're protecting ourselves from radiation, we're reducing pain, right? That's all that matters, not the fact that some animals had to die for our sunscreen. What matters is the ultimate consequence in the end is a lot of us are living a more pleasurable life using sunscreen. So the utilitarianist doesn't care at what had to happen. All they care about is the result. Kant comes along and says, all right, I'm not worried about the consequences. I'm not even worried about the intentions of the heart and how somebody feels about a certain action. I want to know about the action in and of itself. And here's how Kant works this grounding morality. Kant would say two things have to be present. Number one, and I'll start backwards. Remember that sec second formulation of the categorical imperative? Remember this one, not using somebody as a means to an end? See if I can get that one? Yeah, not using somebody as a means to an end. And I've already talked about that earlier. He'd say, well, whatever action's happening, you certainly can't do that. You cannot use somebody as a means to an end. The second you do that, it's immoral. Therefore, the action's wrong. Wow, it's pretty, pretty um, awesome, rational um, aspects of morality here. And remember from the beginning of the lecture when Hume, when I was telling you Hume grounds morality in the last chapter on pure feeling. Remember he says that reason is a slave to the passions. For Hume, as far as what action should we be doing, well, the one that makes you feel better. Or if you feel good doing it, that's where you should be, right? It's got nothing to do with reason. Kant's going to be like, you're out of your mind. The only thing you should be thinking out is purely rationally, are you using somebody else to get what you want? The second you use somebody else as a means to an end, it's immoral. Let me give you an example. This is mind boggling, but it, it plays out for this way. So Kant would say that when you're dating somebody and let's say you were to have sex with them outside of marriage, listen, listen, listen to Kant's reasoning. Let's map it on here. He would say, you're using somebody as a means to an end and you're getting pleasure out of them. But the second you use them as a means to an end, what you're being immoral. So Kant would say, Having sex outside of a marriage is totally immoral because you're not valuing their inherent worth. You're using them for your own pleasure, right? So Kant would say the only thing you could do at this point is get married so that both of you agree that you will um, value their inherent worth by being married so that when you're having sex with them, you're not using them as a means to an end. And the reason you're not doing that is you both... Um, are bound by a social contract saying you love them so much you value them um, for their inherent worth and therefore you get married therefore you can have sex so you could see how his morality can play out again you don't want to use somebody as a means to an end so that's how Kant would think about his morality right so let me backtrack let's go to the first um, um, imperative on how you would um, will that something become a universal law? And it sounds like really wordy, like you don't know what's happening. Um, I'll give you an example of that. So let me just, let me just quickly review. If you look at the person and the character and the motives or the intentions of the heart, you might be thinking along the lines of virtue ethics. And that's where Aristotle's huge. This is his field of ethics. And you could read his Nicomachean Ethics. And he's, we're not discussing him in this class in depth because that was from the ancient class. But you might say Hume could fit into this category because he's thinking about the feelings that a person has that might lump up um, into that category of the person. Then you have the action itself that the person's doing. This is where Kant's going to latch on to and say, if that action requires you to use somebody else, it's immoral. And again, the consequences we discussed the utilitarianism uh, and how they could um, do various actions that could definitely use somebody as a means to an end. And they have no problem doing it all day long, as long as the consequence reduces 
pain and maximizes pleasure for the most people possible. Kant would say, eh, both of those might have their weights, uh, but I'm going to dig into the action itself. And now I'll give you an example, finally, of how Kant would um, extend this morality. So let's say I ask you, hey, is it, is it good? Or let's say you ask yourself, is it good for me to cheat on this exam? Or let's just say, is it good for me to cheat overall in an online college class? And you might think of a bunch of different ways how to cheat, but you just ask the question, a basic one. Is it all right for me to cheat to get ahead? I'm doing something that I don't think my students would approve, my, my peer students are, would approve of, or even my professor. But I'm going to ponder this question as if I'm Kant, right? So that Kant could help me realize if what I'm doing is wrong. Kant would say, okay, take the action that you're thinking about, cheating as a college student, and extend it to all students everywhere in any um, time period and say, should all students cheat at all times? So don't just ask the question of this particular instance, should I cheat? Now universalize the action all across the board and say, students cheating at all times, everywhere, in any class, in any time period. What happens if that were to happen, that action were, were to be universalized? Cheating rampantly at across all times, all periods. Of, you would have a, devastation, a devastating effect on education. You might say people might not actually learn anything. They'd, they'd be cheating, and that's just to get a better grade or whatever. But, but to understand and learn, uh, it goes way beyond cheating. So Kant would say, if you universalize this action and you end up with massive contradictions or uh, things that would be very devastating for humanity as a whole, you would say it's immoral. Therefore, don't cheat. Therefore, be honest. So you might say for, for Kant, you get these really cool things like be honest, be trustworthy, because you can extend those all across the map. Should I be honest? Extend honesty to all people at all times. And you might say oh, that that has way less contradictions than cheating. So you could think about this um, um, in another example. I'll give you a, even a negative one. And it sucks, but it makes the point. Should I cheat on my significant other if I'm on a relationship? If I'm in a relationship with him, I'm not happy anymore. I'm going to cheat on him. Uh, extend that and say, should all people at all times, you know, anywhere in the world, they should all cheat. Everybody, everybody just cheat and continue to cheat. <laughs> that is absurd. And it would have massive amount of broken hearts, divorces, kids would be involved, massive amounts of, of damage to humanity and contradictions. Therefore, it's immoral. Don't cheat. See, with Kant, he can crank out that. Um, he can crank out the morality of that action by saying it would lead to massive disaster and, and really bad consequences and contradictions. Therefore, don't cheat be faithful. So we can see how Kant's ethics can be mapped out and you could look at the actual action itself. And this is where his duty comes in. And he says, therefore, it's your duty to do it forever at all times, at all places. You must be trustworthy. You must be faithful. You must be on and on and on and on. So that's how Kant's ethics can map out very clean in, in a very clean way. And you might say, if you're a Kantian, that's how you do your ethics. You look specifically at the action. Let me give you another one. Murder. Kant would say it's not good to murder anybody at any time, no matter what. That's just it. Murder's wrong. Therefore, don't do it. Um, whereas a utilitarianist looking at the consequences might say, ah, maybe, maybe you could murder somebody as long as the consequences in the grand scheme of things end out better for people in the long run. So you could see Kant and utilitarianism going at odds with each other. And that's why I mention this. So in the great conversation, Kant is huge as far as ethics. So the utilitarianism or the utilitarianists, and they're at war with each other. They're, they're constantly disagreeing. One's focusing on the consequences. One's focusing on the, uh, uh, the action instead. Um, anyways, so if you're, um, if you're fascinated with Kant's ethics, it, sometimes it's known as deontological ethics. Deon means duty in Greek, so it's duty-focused, and it just means this. 
whatever the action is, it's your duty to do it. Meaning you can't just ponder it. You actually have to do it. Um, and that's pretty much it for the Kant um, lecture here. But what I want to do is I want to go back. I want to see if I can... Um, I'm going to see if I can go back to this um, document that I had. Just to see if I can enable my pen. And if not, I'll, I'll um, discontinue the lecture because I'm done anyways. Yeah, I guess so. I think I broke my pen. Okay, so bottom line is um, we got Kant's epistemology metaphysics. He's got more categories of reality than Aristotle. It gets extremely complicated how he does his um, metaphysics, and the, the phenomenal world is the, the world that he's stuck behind with these categories of reality that we map on inherent in us, and the nominal world is the world out there. So we can never really get to the world out there by first starting with our own experience first. And we're going to have categories that we have to deal with. And then we have his ethics. So that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, just let me know. Um, all right. Thanks for hanging in there.